Haggerty Bull Market. In case you're wondering what all of these cars have in common, that theory. These 10 cars and this motorcycle. Yes, and that motorcycle have all been identified by Haggerty's valuation folks as being poised to take a jump in value. This may be bull market, but we're not actually motivated by the money. See, we collect classic cars because they're fun. If that fun should happen to come with a side order of cheap, well then all the better. So let's take a look at this year's picks for bull market and discuss what makes each one of them cool. Sup, evil Knievel. You know, you're missing two wheels, right? I'm really a bike guy, Camissa. Half the wheels, twice the thrills. Oh, for the love of God, this is going to be a long episode. So, Jason, you're saying that the Haggerty valuation folks have got a crystal ball? Yeah. Don't be jealous. I've seen the way you drive. Clearly, you have two of them. <laughs> Those are brass. But I, you know, I do have this. Where the hell did you have that? I see. Oh, God. Jason is about to explain the bull market rules. For the first time in history, someone with a crystal ball is accurate because I'm going to. Look, the bull market isn't investment advice, but you might have noticed that the classic car hobby isn't always as expensive as it looks. I see. New cars depreciating a lot. Right, and classic cars don't. And sometimes they appreciate. Sometimes they appreciate enough to cover their maintenance and upkeep. I see. A an Excel spreadsheet? Uh, right, because Haggerty has an entire team of nerds who do nothing but make spreadsheets and crunch numbers, and they look for trends. And every year they identify 10 cars <clears throat> and one motorcycle that are likely to appreciate. I see. The workings of a four-stroke engine? All right, so let's look at this in terms of an engine. All right, the piston's gone up, it's compressed the air, the fuel has been injected, and we're approaching top dead center. Fireball! Exactly! All it takes is one little spark to ignite the mixture and expand their value. I see. Oh, great. A bunch of expensive cars that I can't afford. Oh my God, Miss Cleo, put down the crystal ball and look over here because there are a bunch of cars that even you can afford. Psychics. It is hard to believe that the 350Z is about to turn 21 years old, but it is. It made its debut in 2002 with a bang because it immediately re-earned Nissan all of the street cred that it had lost when it retired the 300ZX. This may have looked nothing like any of the previous Zs, but it kept the recipe intact. Cheap speed. And a lot of it. Corvettes have always been about cheap and fast. But the C5 Z06 had in handling. This thing grips. It was the first Corvette that showed the world's best sports cars that Chevrolet really meant business. It cost half as much as cars it could outperform. And today, a great condition Z06 only costs about half its original inflation-adjusted sticker price. 
The 350Z is the home of Nissan's now legendary VQ35, a three and a half liter all aluminum four cam V6 that made 300 horsepower, plus enough noise to be the official snake charmer of an entire generation of enthusiasts enthralled by its guttural exhaust sound. <laughs> so good. And here's another exhaust note to write home about. The C5 C06 came with a titanium exhaust. This thing has 405 horsepower, weighs only 3,100 pounds, and does zero to 60 in four seconds flat! The best part is anytime you see either of these vehicles in the real world, they're being driven hard. on a cold core lawn, and I hope I never do. This car belongs on track. Well, you don't see a Z06 puttering down the promenade just to be seen. That thing is so track focused, you couldn't even get it with the Corvette's removable roof. like the open air. That's why I'm a bike guy as much as I am a car guy. I'm riding the 1938 Harley-Davidson Knucklehead and it's fantastic. This is a bike that pretty much started that whole modern image of Harley-Davidson. desirable of the old Harleys because of its Art Deco styling, its historical significance, and the fact that it's a real rider. You can take this cross country in a vintage rally. fantasize about driving a car with a little tiny motorcycle engine in it. Well, the Suzuki Cappuccino doesn't have a motorcycle engine. It's even smaller. At 657 cc's, this whole three-cylinder engine is barely bigger than one of the cylinders in that Harley. And with a removable roof and weighing only 1,700 pounds, well, this is the closest experience you can get to a motorcycle on four wheels. And it's probably the smallest traditional sports car you'll ever see. Engine mounted up front, but behind the front wheels. Rear drive with a limited slip and a five-speed manual. Double wishbone suspension, rack and pinion steering. This thing means big business. It also means big fun. And it's proof that you don't need to have big power to put a big smile on your face. <laughs> big power and big speed, I mean, they're automatically fun. Mm -hmm. But most times, there's something more to it than that. Right, I say this to people all the time when they ask about really fast cars. It doesn't matter how fast the car is, eventually, you get used to it. Yeah, and then what you got? 
the experience. Right. And that's what's so great about older cars. Yeah, now. I mean, I yeah. feel like that wasn't always the case, right? It's really the last 10 or 15 years that car companies have doubled down on isolation. And so I think we're gonna have a lost generation of driver's cars that don't give us the interactivity that we really want, but then aren't fast enough to keep up with all the electric stuff that's coming. Look, there's nothing really wrong with turbos and hybrids and automatics. Yeah, but there's something oh so right about interacting with a machine and relishing in the noise. And besides, automatics keep evolving, mm -hmm. but a good manual mm -hmm. is timeless. Right. And thank God that's being reflected in the value of manual transmission cars. Even these two things, they carry a 20 to 30% price premium if they come without the automatic, and that is growing. I don't want no dang automatic in my collector car. No way. If I'm gonna drive something without a clutch pedal, might as well be electric. What? When the R8 came out, the world stopped and stared. We'd never seen a shape like this before, especially not with that side blade. It looked like a concept car driving down the street. That was something previously only the purview of Lamborghini. Who knew these companies could pull off the same trick? The Murcielago was the first Lamborghini designed under Audi ownership. And seeing these gorgeous cousins together is a feast for the eyes. And the ears. Fun comes in many forms, but it always tends to accompany engines that love to rev. Audi's V10 revs to almost 9,000 RPM. And it makes some of the most hauntingly delicious sounds in the process. <laughs> it should be said that the base R8's V8 sounds almost as good and revs almost as high. And here's the important part. Both of these engines have very light flywheels, so they're lippy and revy and they're fun to interact with. And you'd miss out on that if you drove one of these cars with an automatic or automated manual. So it doesn't matter which engine you choose in an R8, it's a perfect match for this six-speed gated chip. This one has it too. Lamborghini only made about as many manual transmission Mercies as Ferrari made F40s back in the day. This is a very rare car. And this six and a half liter V12 marked the end for the engine that made Lamborghini, Lamborghini. It was the company's first road car engine going into production in 1963 as a three and a half liter and it hung around for 47 glorious years, culminating in this six and a half liter, 640 horsepower monster. The R8 does everything well. It's a genuinely everyday usable supercar <laughs> with a choice of engines that'll make your hair stand on end. Neither of these cars is inexpensive, but when you compare them to their peers, there's something of a bargain, especially when you factor in how well they're predicted to do in value. While we're on the subject of manual transmission bargains, let's talk about a car that was never available with a manual and is the most expensive of our whole bull market group. Remember that the term bargain is relative. The Mercedes SLR McLaren is currently downright cheap when compared to the mind-blowing group of legends that went on sale at the same time. Carrera GT, Ford GT, Ferrari Enzo. It was often overlooked in that group, but the carbon-tubbed McMurk was right in the thick of its competition where speed is concerned. Thanks to a 617 horsepower V8, it hit 60 in three and a half seconds and topped out at 207 miles an hour. It was, in a word, Lamborghini fast. <laughs> Oh, oh. Oh. The very
very fast SLR had a very tortured start. See, Mercedes contacted McLaren, still sparkling from the F1, to make a supercar super halo. McLaren's Gordon Murray wanted to put the engine behind the driver, but the Germans said nein. Quite the fight ensued, which the Germans won passive aggressively by rolling out an SLR concept car with the engine up front. There was no going back, but Murray did manage to physically move the engine back by almost three feet compared to that Mercedes design. McLaren then continued to do all the engineering work and even build the SLR. What came out of that tumultuous one-car stand was a Mercedes with the McLaren treatment, meaning as simple and lightweight as possible for something with a Mercedes badge on it. The SLR lacked that racetrack focus that, like the Ford GT, the Carrera GT, and the Enzo had, so buyers sometimes overlooked it. But now, this thing is a fraction of the price of those cars. And what you get for that money is a carbon-bodied coupe with supercar doors and a muscle car motor. My God! <laughs> muscle car motor, sure. But this is a real God bless America muscle car. The AMX put AMC back on the map, if only temporarily. Its name stood for American Motors Experimental, and it was the company's short wheelbase two-seat version of the four-seat Javelin. This was AMC's answer to the Mustang and Camaro that were stealing the pony car scene. Like any real muscle car, the AMX came with an American pushrod V8, American Motors to be exact, 290, 343, or 390 cubic inches. With the monster motor, this thing could do zero to 60 in seven seconds. The AMX was fast. And hilariously, magazines at the time called it heavy. At 3,340 pounds, that's 500 pounds lighter than the carbon fiber SLR. Because that's the march of progress, Randy. As time goes on, we all get a little heavier. Speak for yourself, Jason. I believe I just did. Speaking of American heavyweights, uh -huh. Nothing has got more of both than what I got lined up for you next. Oh, I'm a little scared. Hey, Randy, grab my hand. Good now. I can't reach it over there. I wanted to hate this thing so badly, but I love it. Oh my God. I got it. Oh my <laughs> God. You are a lunatic. Yeah. No. This brute started its career in 1984 as the military-grade AM General High Mobility Multipurpose Wheeled Vehicle, or HMMWV, or just Humvee. It went on sale to the public eight years later, and eventually General Motors bought the rights to its name and created Hummer as an entire brand of trucks. The H1 is inextricably linked to former California governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who owned five of them. That may seem excessive, but hey, have you seen this thing? It defines excess. I think it's pretty cool. I, oh my God. What is more ridiculous than driving a Hummer H1 on a tiny, narrow, twisty mountain road? I'll tell you, driving one fast on the mountain road. Oh my God, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> As we slide around these corners, let me remind you, this car did not have to pass crash or safety standards. What? Yeah, no airbag. But I love that we live in a world where this thing is legal to drive on the road because it really shouldn't be. Hey, when the American military needed something tough to get us through Operation Desert Storm, this was it. And if it was reliable enough to do that, then it certainly can handle this. Careful, Randy. Rumor has it if you say that word three times in a row, a Toyota appears. What, we're reliable? Yeah, that's the one. Careful, that's two. Reliable! Cue the voiceover, folks. Yes, sir, if there's one company whose reputation is built on reliability, it's Toyota. And almost nothing embodies that indestructibility like a Toyota pickup. 
In fact, Top Gear once tried to kill one of these pickups and failed. If those guys can't kill one, no one can. This is a fourth generation Toyota pickup, known in the rest of the world as the Hilux. Toyota didn't give it a name in the US, but it's a rolling testament to the company's bulletproof engineering that made Toyota so famous. You don't need a name when you're this good. This is a pickup with no enemies, but it has fans spanning every generation. Its appearance in the original Back to the Future movie helped the unnamed truck make a name for itself, and its incredible desirability today hangs on its authenticity. Randy, let's go back to the future IRL and discuss the fact that the Saab 900 is the best time machine ever made. It accurately predicted the future. All right, now, Jason, what's IRL and what are you talking about with a Saab? IRL is in real life, and in real life, the Saab 900 Turbo really did predict the future. Think about it. It is a front-wheel drive, four-cylinder, turbocharged, safety-obsessed, comfortable hatchback. I mean, if it had SUV ground clearance, it would be the same description as every best-selling car today. Yeah, but none of those things are anywhere near as cool as a Saab. Okay. Saabs are cool because they're quick, right? This whole car is nuts. Like, all right, it's front-wheel drive, but the engine's longitudinal, which is weird enough, except it's turned 180 degrees backwards and then laid over at its side with the transmission underneath it. Saab did everything really weird. And it drives like a luxury car. I mean, here we are, squealing tires in perfect comfort. Look at that drifty entry. Scandinavia! There is a fair amount of body roll. It was one of very few turbocharged production cars. And they used a small turbo for quiet mid-range acceleration for quick response. It was the first turbo in a car that was not a sports car. Yeah, but this thing is so good. Look, the 900 was effectively Saab's second ever car, and it became the de rigueur choice for every tweed-wearing college professor. I mean, who knew that college professors liked speed so much? You know, it doesn't take a crystal ball to see that people like power. I, I don't know how to tell you this. I don't want to hear about your ball. <laughs> At the end of the day, what we're all looking for is joy. This group of 10 cars and a motorcycle has something for everyone. Whether your idea of fun is being off-road, on a racetrack, or just being seen in a beautiful shape, these are ways for you to never stop driving, and with the extra bonus that your hobby might cost you less, or even nothing. We don't have any more powerful crystal ball than anyone else, but here's one thing we can guarantee. Driving any of these machines is more fun than watching your 401k. In fact, owning one of these is like being able to drive your 401k. And that's why they're picks for Haggerty's 2023 bull market. Yeah.